Thank you, everyone. It's my great honor to be here. Um, so I would like to take just a few minutes to introduce to you the organization that I represent today, the Shanghai Tech University. Uh, let's see if it works. Oh. So Shanghai Tech University, it's a very small uh, scale research university. It was established in 2013 by the Ministry of Education of China and in collaboration with the Chinese Academy of Science. So these are some figures. We've got uh, 1,500 undergraduates. So our target is to have 6,000 students in total, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, and also uh, 1,000 faculty members. So we're about halfway there. Uh, we have a a couple of schools. We have the School of Physical Science and Technology, School of Life Science and Technology, and the School of Information Science and Technology. Those are the three schools that actually have students. So there are two schools that don't have our own students, which is the School of Entrepreneurship and Management and the School of Creativity and Art, which I represent. So what do we do? We don't have students. We offer classes and um, workshops and events to uh, the students in other schools. Because we are a science and technology school, we think it is important important that they also learn arts, they also learn uh, literature, so that when they graduate, they actually become a whole person. Um, so here are a list of some of the schools that we work with. Uh, for example, we've been working with the USC Cinematic School for four years now. So we have professional workshops for young Chinese um, filmmakers in producing, directing, and writing. So we look, uh, look to form um, many more partnerships like this. So some pictures of our campus and the people at Shanghai Tech. I invite all of you who have a chance to visit Shanghai next time. You can contact me, and uh, we can arrange a campus tour. It's a huge campus, and it's very pretty, actually. Um, so some of the events that we do at the School of uh, Creativity and Art, you can see, um, you know, they range from everything from AI to uh, human imagination to research into science and of imagination and to art exhibit, and also like photography. And we talk about the letters between uh, Vincent van Gogh and his uh, brothers. So it's everything. Um, science and technology and art. So this is what we try to do. We try to merge artists, designers, and with scientists and technolo technologists uh, so that they can come up with, with something that's innovative and uh, really new. So some of the projects I have listed here um, are the ones I'm uh, working on. So uh, very recently, I brought a um, painter, or uh, he's also a very young modern artist in China, uh, to meet with the uh, uh, scientists at the three schools that I mentioned, so they're from the life science department, they from chemistry, material science, and this artist actually last week came up with three very interesting proposals that will have elements of the scientist's research work into his new uh, works of art. So we are actually incubating such projects, and we look forward to seeing something interesting by the end of this year. So this is the idea, basically. You can see everything falls under the, the big un umbrella of science and technology, and then we add art and design. So just uh, two very short clips to show you what we've been doing at the Shanghai Tech University. This is a uh, small project in collaboration with the Shanghai Museum. So it's a VR application. So basically, you can actually go into uh, some of the Chinese paintings exhibited at the Shanghai Museum. And what you can do is, if you're interested in one of the paintings, you can choose it, and you can try to make changes to it. So it's just a little fun piece using VR. And if you get dizzy wearing the VR headset, we have something in AR as well. So with this one, you can... Ooh, it's loud. So uh, it's, it's too loud. So, so basically, it's a, a VR or AR application. So um, this is a pop singer in China. Uh, she has a lot of fans. So if you really like your, your, your singers or movie stars, you can recreate a virtual concert on your uh, mobile devices. So these are the something, uh, some of the interesting projects that we've been developing at Shanghai Tech, but many more. We are working people in synthetic biology to 
uh, use bacteria to actually paint and make art installations. So I invite you to visit Shanghai Tech when you get a chance. By the end of this year, we're going to have a lot of uh, interesting work to present. So next up, I'm going to introduce the uh, panelists for this session. Um, Wen Feng Liu, uh, who joined ITE, one of the largest uh, online content production and um, distribution platforms in China in 2012, and currently serves as the chief technology officer. He is in charge of ITE's technology research and development, IT infrastructure and operation, product development, and enge engineering, and product marketing and business development, so basically everything. And prior to ITE, he held senior positions at VMware China and Intel China Research Center and spearheaded Intel's global initiatives. Our next panelist is Zhang Xiaoming, who is Deputy Director of the Research Center for Cultural Policy at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Now, he is also the Director of the Special Committee at the Central Cultural Enterprises and State-Owned Asset Supervision and Leading Group Office at the Ministry of Finance in China. He is a longtime cultural policy researcher and participated in the formation of national cultural system reform plans and the central and local cultural development plans. Next one is Zach Kaplan. He is the executive director of RISM, the leading born digital art institution and longtime affiliate of the New Museum in New York. Now, since 1996, RISM has championed born digital art and cultural through the innovation um, innovative exhibitions, commissions, preservation, and software development programs. And before Ryzen, Kaplan worked at the Renaissance Society in Chicago and the Mu Museum of the Con Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Um, next, we have Mia Yu, who is the artistic director of La Mama. Now, Mia spearheaded La Mama's kids program and digital initiative with Culture Hub, so that's why we have another guest from Culture Hub to speak uh, along with her. And she was a grant recipient of the New Generations Future Leaders Program, and as a member of the Gray um, Jones uh, Repertory uh, Company, uh, she performed in many productions, so she's actually an actor as well. And uh, like I said, she's going to present with, along with Billy Clark, who is the founder and artistic director of Culture Hub, and has overseen the development of its artistic, education, and community programs since 2009. Clark performed with many noble artists and is a professor at the Seoul Institute of the Arts. So um, that's all the uh, panelists we have. We might have a surprise guest if he arrives on time, and I'll introduce if he does come. So let's welcome our first guest, uh, Wen Feng Liu from ITE. Thanks, Yi, for the invitation. So I'm Wen Feng Liu. I'm the CTO of ITE, which is one of the online video services in China. And uh, uh, I just read the recipe of uh, the speakers, and it looks like I'm the only some of the guys who is uh, in, uh, in the engineering side, not the culture, not arts design. So maybe my presentation is a little bit different from others. Okay. So firstly, let me introduce uh, a little bit about IGE. The IGE, our mission is to be a uh, technology-based, so I'm very proud of that because we are a technology-based entertainment company. So finally, it's still an entertainment company, and uh, we like to bring uh, joy and fun to all the people and their families. So we provide content, provide uh, all the uh, kind of entertainment to our users in every uh, uh, kind of ways. So. Since our establishment in around 2010, that's we already have a lot of uh, invite, uh, innovation to products and engineering and our uh, technologies and all, as well as uh, to the contents and marketing. So the users can enjoy the massive contents from our library in higher quality, in a uh, richest way. So we get, go to, went to public in this March in NASDAQ, and uh, we have been ranked number one, continuously been number one in the last several years, that's in terms of uh, marketing share in China of uh, inter uh, internet video. So uh, today I'd like to 
to tell you the truth, that's uh, why we can do that, uh, being that Excel in the last uh, several, uh, eight years. That's because I think that's one of the major reasons is our unique culture, which is uh, uh, the combination between the engineering and the creative. So uh, our team is actually 50 to 50 split of the uh, development engineers and the creative talents. So that's very difficult for that because you know the way of the and the, the way of thinking and working of uh, engineers and the uh, creative peoples are very different. And uh, uh, because because the nature of uh, working and the knowledge background, even their work, their, their lifestyle, their working hours are also different. But we need to put them together so that we can break the border of uh, this simplery so that they can have a more innovative idea about how to do in something, doing the entertainment in a better way. So with the, with the inclusive and the mutual respect to these both teams, we, uh, we foster an environment that can continuously create uh, blockbuster contents to the China market, to China users, and uh, we will see that, like, uh, for example, the variety shows, we have uh, uh, China's top variety shows, which is uh, self-produced by our employees, by our own studios. So uh, in these slides, there's uh, uh, examples about what, uh, what kind of cutting-edge technologies uh, have been utilized in our creative areas. So uh, from, from left to right, you can see that it's a typical uh, development phase of a content. So usually uh, when a content, when an IP is over there, we need to pick up which IP should be developed with uh, uh, in which form. Like uh, if there's a literature IP, We'd like to see if that can be converted to comics or to a TV, a TV drama series or to comics. So we actually have uh, an AI technology being employed to predict if that IP can be, uh, can be popular, can, uh, can be viewed by, uh, by fans actually in the, in the time when, when their IP have been developed in the future, maybe in one year or two years. So that prediction is uh, IP valuation phase by our technology, which is uh, to analyze the current audience of the IP, of that content, and analyze the, uh, the competition uh, environment in two years to see if uh, we can maximize the IP value of that. So we also have uh, the technology being used in the post-production of a content, especially the variety show. So for kind of a variety show, the, you know, the production, the production of the variety show is uh, more and more complicated than before because uh, in the, in exactly one scene, we have uh, multiple cameras. Uh, so as, ma as many as about 50 cameras so capture the same scene at the same time. So that uh, produce a problem is uh, for one hour, for uh, one hour variety show, we may need about 3,000 hours uh, original contents to uh, edit and, and, uh, uh, and make uh, the final, uh, final contents. So it's very time consuming and costly, so we actually uti utilize AI in the post-production workflow to analyze the contents, the video contents, the, the voice contents, and also the, uh, like the, uh, the people uh, have been in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the show and make the metadata for that and uh, give that to the editors so that they can, they can improve the efficiency in the post-production uh, process. And we also have the uh, intelligent distribution. So I'm seeing that uh, when we step into the AI era, uh, we are seeing that the content is uh, very diff in a very different way to distribute it to users. So you know, in the internet area, that's uh, every people will uh, search, will uh, browse the contents from a media uh, website or from a, a big library and find something they may interest. But in the AI area, that's a content will be distributed uh, in a personalized way to everyone. 
at that time, you can see that the content is a kind of a more decentralized uh, content network, and uh, it will dramatically increase the, uh, increase the quantity of the content because everyone can be producers and everyone can be the consumers, and everyone can be easily be uh, consumed those contents they may have interest, uh, which is decided by algorithm. And we also have the intelligent monetization, which is uh, we can utilize AI to auto-generate ads uh, based on the contents. So you can imagine that in, uh, uh, if you are watching an intimate kissing scene, and we give you uh, ads of a diamond ring, which will generate more uh, better contents, uh, better results for that. So uh, with that, we are having a lot of uh, new monetization with the content, and we utilize technology to maximize those IP values through the workflow, and uh, we uh, we achieve the goal to have a better entertainment uh, result. And oh, I have another thing to mention that's uh, about the uh, intelligent casting. So that's also a very interesting uh, thing that uh, we never imagine about the casting with technology because it's in very early stage of uh, 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 production and it's a very traditional way. So usually casting director always have interviews with the actors and actresses to see if they can fit any role in the, uh, in the script. And, but for now, the TV, TV drama series always mm, Typically, they have uh, more than 115 script roles, and they need to find a lot of uh, uh, actors and actresses. So if uh, you interview three and you got one, you should have uh, 450 interviews for that. So we utilize AI technology to analyze all the videos uh, being publicly or privately uploaded to our platform and uh, analyze uh, their body language and face and uh, characters of uh, each actor and have that, been, have that structured data being input into our database, uh, which can be used later for the, uh, for the matching between the uh, requirements who the casting director will input into our system. So for that, we can have a better candidate than before for a, for a role, and uh, especially for tier three or tier four role in the TV drama, they do not need to change. And maybe for tier two, they may have uh, another interview, but at that time, they already have the, have, uh, uh, the machine been help, helping already and save a lot of time on that. So that will dramatically save time and save cost and to lower uh, the total cost of uh, TV drama serial in the budget, uh, under the budget line. So uh, as a summary, that's uh, iQiyi is a company which is technology based. So we uh, take advantage of uh, technology to uh, make uh, uh, better uh, I mean, output uh, for everywhere we can use for that. So it can help our creative people can make better contents. It also help our uh, uh, customers, our users can have a better experience. Yeah. So that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very honored to have the opportunity here to share some views with you today. I'm the first uh, Chinese speaker, and I apologize for that. I, my English is not fluent enough to allow me to engage in the academic discussion, so I have to resort to my Chinese. So the topic for my presentation is the new era of great to creative industry and cultural heritage preservation. I'm um, going to cover three points. Uh, one, the trend. China is already entering a new period. Now, since uh, 2015, uh, we enter a new period of uh, new innovation. That means we have entered the second half, or what we call the version 2.0 period. First of all, since 2010, the development of cultural and creative industries has slowed down steadily uh, from 2004 to 2010. The average uh, growth rate was 23.4, but uh, uh, since uh, 2011, it has been declining. 
By uh, 2011, it was 21.96, then uh, 16.5 by 2012. By 2013, the growth rate was 11.1%, 12.1% in 2014, 2015, 11%, 2016, 13%, 2017, 10.8%. It is fair to say that compared to the GDP growth rate, the cultural, the cultural sector growth rate is about 4 to 5% higher than the GDP growth. Its development, its development has entered a very stable phase. It has reached a plateau. In this process, the structure of the whole industry has undergone profound changes. Based on statistics ever since 2010, public companies in the cultural sector has seen, have seen their operating incomes increasing dramatically. If you take a look at if you look at all these companies ever since 2011 they have maintained an annual growth rate of more than 20% in 2016 the first quarters their general growth volume was about 60 billion RMB with a 40.2 growth rate also, in terms of BAT, there are many, many different platforms, and Tengxin has become the largest technological platform in China that's in the sector of content delivery. Tencent has already built an ecosystem that's composed of audience and creators and a seamless connection between entertainment, business, and daily life has been realized. And Tencent has become a very, very important source for IP. Just uh, based on the uh, UN Cultural Heritage Report in 2018, the biggest change, put the biggest potential for change in the cultural sector is the uh, channel in terms of how the content is delivered. Reorganization in this sector is inevitable. We can say that this is the first leaping in terms of cultural, in, in terms of the channel in which culture is communicated the first major transformation in over 500 years. We all know that the combination of culture and technology has brought about rapid development of the cultural sector. However, we are beginning to see some mismatch in terms of the development pace of the technology industry uh, and the uh, cultural industry. Because of the development of technology, the cultural sector has become a more materialistic and consumption-heavy industry. Cultural content that you're able to produce will be able to get monetized and communicated to a very wide audience. We all know that Tengxin has over 1 billion customers. And within that customers, a lot of them are active users, thus creating a very vibrant platform for artists to post their work. And not only professional artists, who are able to post content on those platforms, but, but also amateurish, amateur, amateur artists are also able to post their content online. In another word, over the past 10 years, we have seen a huge change in terms of create creativity source. Instead of just, instead of just a small group of creative artists more than 10 years ago, 
we're seeing a new, a newer generation of artists who are better equipped with technology and who are better to communicate their artistic ideas to the general public. In comparison, amateurish, amateurish artists, professionals, in fact, are enjoying a much, much bigger advantage than traditional artists because they're more well-versed with the technology, they know how to engage audience and customers and clients online. And that's one advantage that traditional artists do not have. In China, in China, we have we have about 760,000 historical sites in China. However, a lot of them are stationary, and in China, we have about 5,000 museums. However, the space utilization rate is less than 2%. And for museum like the Forbidden City Palace Museum, the utilization rate is even lower. That shows a huge mismatch between the demand for cultural content and the utilization rate of our cultural institutions. The core reason is that art professionals are still stuck in the 20th century where technology was not playing a very significant role. They would need to migrate to the first 21st century and try to utilize technologies as a platform to communicate their artistic concepts. Another concept is that the exploding development of AI and virtual reality and all those technologies are enabling newer generations of artists to really build a really well-rounded and very comprehensive industry. For example, Europina, a European digital library, is beginning to take shape. And with technology as a backbone, universities and other artistic institutions are able to work together to really delve deeper, to really dive deeper into communicating arts to a wider audience, opening up, opening up new channel for traditional art, art institutions to work with 21st century institutions to really bring about value for all the investors. And in doing so, we'll be able to further inspire cultural creation and art creation. And by doing so, we can also increase the utilization rate of our art collection in different museums using AI, using technology as a, as a backbone to really communicate all these ideas to, to a wider audience who otherwise would not be able to attend or visit a museum in person. So in summary, we are seeing a huge integration, a resource integration of all the cultural, all the digital and cultural resources. Digital consumption and presentation models would, would be changed dramatically. Such an ecosystem must be, must be relying on the coordination and cooperation between state, among different stakeholders. It re involves cooperation among the government, the private sector, and the NGO. Currently, one of the biggest obstacles in terms of really communicate cultural ideas to the public is to how to express, how to spread the idea as far as possible. How can we use technology as a pathway to further our, our artistic costs? 
And one way is to be more welcoming, to be more inclusive, in, instead of just focusing on well-established. And an older generation of artists, we should be embracing newer generations of artists who are able to utilize technology as an enabler for their art form. I feel like traditional Chinese culture was based on paper, was based on written recording, and that is not compatible with the current artistic landscape and cultural landscape. We have to, we have to migrate the whole new old the, the, the news industry, the art industry, and the cultural industry into the 21st century. And even the government has put forth relevant directives and documents in support of such effort to emphasize to make use of technology as a wonderful platform to further communicate our cultural heritage and cultural concepts and ideas. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zachary Kaplan. I'm executive director of Rhizome. Uh, thank you to the Asia Society and to the Beijing Contemporary Art Foundation for organizing this event. And there's already been so much to think about. Uh, and I feel like some of the topics that I'll discuss today uh, relate to the last speaker's remarks, hopefully positively. Um, so I'm going to begin with like a few points of principle off my device. <laughs> and then I have a slideshow that can look at some specifics of the work that we do at Rhizome. So I guess to begin, the way we think about the culture and technology conversation is to say that culture and technology are more or less synonymous. Uh, every artwork leverages some form of technology, and every technology has a cultural point of view. Um, our focus at Rhizome has been the relationship between art and digital networks like the web or new digital tools like artificial intelligence. And in fact, if you were reading the New York Times this morning, uh, there was a story about artificial intelligence in museums that talked about some of our work with it. Um, and then also uh, platform, uh, you know, new tools like VR or AR. And our approach to that focus, that focus on art and digital networks and tools, has been to try and be as holistic as, part, uh, holistic as possible. And so we work with artists and we work with technologists. We explore new tools and we build them in-house. And we do this in our own unique uh, art tech context at Rhizome, but also in a contemporary art context through uh, our longtime affiliate, the New Museum. So let me just go to the next. So at Rhizome, we champion born digital art and culture. That's the kind of frame that we give for all of these disparate activities in art and tech. Um, and we do this through commissions platforms, exhibition platforms, and digital preservation platforms. And as I said, we've been an affiliate of the New Museum since 2003. And I should note that the relationship between New Museum and Rhizome is shared, is basically around the shared interest in art and tech as an emergent and continually developing field. Uh, the New Museum was the first US museum to have a uh, media lounge in the early 2000s. And then in 2003, we linked up as part of this broad effort between both of our organizations to kind of be at the frontier of this field. So when I talk about commissions, um, we primarily support uh, a variety of digital things. Um, last year, we premiered uh, the first museum mobile VR app exhibition, which featured six new uh, commissions by a variety of contemporary artists. On the right is a piece by Jacoby Satterwhite. Um, we also uh, commission works through a platform called Seven on Seven, which just celebrated its 10th anniversary in May. Um, this is a program that brings together leaders from the art and technology field uh, to create new works of art or prototypes through close short-term creative collaboration. And we've actually learned a lot uh, from this program and just about how meaningful it can be to get an engineer and an artist in a room and ask them to make something, anything, <laughs> that could explain something about the current state of our culture or technology worlds and how they intersect. So on the left, Miranda July working with the uh, uh, developer Paul Ford in 2016 on the right. Um, Trevor Paglin and Mike Krieger discussing uh, machine vision tools as part of the 2015 edition. 
Our exhibitions program has been primarily focused on new modes of exhibition making, so like that First Look VR app. Um, this is a major exhibition uh, that we've been presenting online since 2016 called Nettered Anthology. And what it is is a uh, ongoing project that is presenting on more or less a weekly basis uh, 100 works that define internet art as a field of practice and really as a diverse and di divergent field of practice. Um, this is a really interesting project uh, that has leveraged a lot of things we do at Rhizome, um, but expresses uh, our longtime focus on online exhibition making. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't also produce gallery exhibitions. And in fact, uh, 16 works from this anthology program will anchor a new major exhibition that we're opening at the New Museum in January, which will talk about archival practices and net art, um, basically how uh, works made with technology, new technologies are almost always uh, in conversation with their later obsolescence. And so on the left, you have a piece that will be in the presentation by the artist Eduardo Catch, which is this uh, kind of amazing work for the defunct Minitel network. And on the right, uh, an, a sculptural piece by the artist Pope Bell that relates to a series of websites he made in the mid-2000s. And finally, we have a digital preservation program. And this is something that's developed over the past few years and really distinguishes our work. Um, we've had this longtime commitment to born digital things of all kinds, websites, software, apps. Um, and over the years, as we've dealt with those technological obsolescence questions, we've realized that we need to answer some of those problems for ourselves and that our unique kind of field of interest could actually create tools that could help bring born digital things more into the collections and museum mainstream. So in 2015, we launched a software development arm that builds tools for digital preservation. Um, one of our major platforms is an emulation framework, which allows us to present uh, a variety of legacy software directly to a user through embeddable virtual machines. <laughs> Basically, you can go visit a website and interact with a legacy software array from the 80s, for example. This is a piece from 1997, a uh, net art work. Um, and then we've also developed a, a new platform for web archiving that seeks to uh, basically allow relatively untrained individuals to create fully interactive copies of almost any website with the kind of things that we care about intact. So that's like interaction or embedded media or all the things that could take a website from being just an assortment of code and uh, bring it into a cultural object. Um, and this is a really exciting platform that we've been developing over the past few years. So to conclude my remarks again, uh, our, you know, we've we've found that the that the solution to art and technology as a problem, you can say, is to try and engage with the field as broadly as possible and uh, take both technology and new technologies and uh, artistic creation as kind of co-equal partners in the future of culture. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation. In 1983, Ellen moved to New York from Chicago in the 1950s. When she arrived, she went to St. Patrick's Cathedral and prayed her life would go well in New York. She ended up getting a job across the street as an elevator operator at Saks Fifth Avenue. She lived in the East Village, and one day, as she was wandering the Lower East Side, she met a fabric merchant she called Papa Diamond. He became a father figure to her and would give her scraps of fabric he had lying around. Ellen began fabricating her own dresses, and although she had to wear a schmuck while working at Saks, at lunch she was allowed to take it off. People began inquiring about her dresses. At first they didn't believe she had made them, but in a relatively short period of time, she rose to become one of the executive directors at Saks, which was quite an accomplishment for an African-American woman at that time. Ellen, or Mama, as most people called her, had several friends that were playwrights, struggling artists. She had a stable job and wanted to support them. She rented a basement space on East 9th Street so that they would have a space to read their plays or show their work. That became known as Café La Mama, one of the pioneering theaters that started the off-off-Broadway movement, a theater for experimentation, for underrepresented voices and storytellers, for pushing the boundaries of human potential through art. So La Mama is now in its 57th year, 
Uh, and it's the last of the original off-off Broadway theaters still in operation today. Uh, it has presented more than 5,000 productions, uh, that, uh, the vast majority of which are world premieres. Uh, it has also supported more than 150,000 artists uh, from over 70 different nations. The La Mama Network and what we feel is a creative ecosystem is large. This ecosystem consists of artists and audiences of all nations, cultures, races, and identities. It is a community that is intergenerational, intercultural, interdisciplinary. Like so many, Mian and I grew up as artists at La Mama. We traveled the world with Ellen and were exposed to her one world vision. And this idea remains a core aspect of our ethos at La Mama. Art can be used as a tool to bring people together, uh, to find human connections. And as we think about our legacy, we look to the future and understand the necessity uh, of taking into consideration the challenges in the world since La Mama began. What Ellen was doing, traveling to other countries to engage with artists and local communities or bring these international artists uh, to New York to engage with the audiences here, these analog ways of interacting open the doors uh, to multinational and multicultural collaborations, projects and exchanges, and ultimately revolutionize the landscape of contemporary theater and performance. Today we are faced, as Billy said, with new challenges. Our technological advancements have had an enormous impact on our political, economic, and social systems. The two of us are married. We have a daughter who has grown up as a digital native, and we love to use this example. The first time she saw a television, a regular television, she went to swipe the TV. Her desire <laughs> or instinct was not to was, was, was to engage with it in a totally different way. It wasn't a passive interaction. People's ways, as we have discussed already, of seeing and engaging with the world are changing, and we believe that although certain forms of art will remain, we as artists must explore what new forms will look like with new artists and new audiences. Through simple technology, smart technology, we communicate and see friends and family in remote locations with a few touches on our phones. On the one hand, technology has brought us closer together. However, as we can see by our current political climate, there are significant dangers that permeate the fabric of our global society, and at times, technology can work against us. In 2009, La Mama, in collaboration with the Seoul Institute of the Arts, founded Culture Hub, an art and technology center with studios in Seoul and New York, and now we have hubs in Indonesia and Los Angeles. Through Culture Hub, we began to experiment and explore the possibilities for artists to collaborate in real time over distance. Just as Ellen had been instrumental in the development of reconfigurable theater spaces, with Culture Hub, our goal was to explore how digital technologies, and in particular, the internet, could be layered on these flexible venues. So behind us, you'll see just a, a few images um, uh, from different projects that we've worked on at, at Culture Hub. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to add a new layer of possibilities to our existing international network and use technology as a means to, of building and sustaining a vibrant global arts community. But being that we were brought up by La Mama in an, in an environment of artistic experimentation, it was natural for us to imagine this layer going beyond the obvious directions. So while we use things like telepresence for production meetings and distance learning, uh, for example, we are also highly invested in developing artworks that are not fixed to one geographic location. This can take on a variety of forms, from theater to music, visual art, installation, new media, and other hard to classify interdisciplinary work. We foster an environment where taking risk is encouraged and we provide artists with access to technological tools, technological support, and an international network um, that is primed to initiate multi-location exchanges. The barriers to this type of work are immense. But as new tools develop and internet infrastructures become more widespread, there is a huge untapped potential to craft experiences that bring not only artists together over distance, but also diverse creative communities. For about two years, we have been developing our own browser-based tool called LiveLab, which is free 
and open source and is highly adaptable to artistic practice. So now we'd like to highlight a few um, collaborations that, we've util that have utilized our software platform LiveLab. And this is a connection between um, La Mama here in New York and the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage. So using LiveLab, we connected the two locations for a La Mama Kids workshop uh, that allowed youth from New York to take a virtual field trip to Alaska, where they learned about indigenous language, percussion, and dance, and, di and directly from young artists. This gives local youth access to content and connections that they may not have been able to make in any other way. So connecting our local and global communities. The next project you see is one that we have been developing over the past seven years, which is called Digital Duets. It brings dancers in disparate locations into one shared physical space. Through the use of projection techniques and telepresence technologies, the dancers are able to improvise in real time, sensing each other's presence in this liminal space that is created. We are able to play with scale and augment different aspects of the dance or the story. In telematic performances, we can also have live exchanges with audiences, increasing this feeling of connection. It is not just an artist-to-artist -artist connection, but a community-to-community -community one. Um, but it's also possible to make connections that go beyond point to point. Last fall, we presented an event that celebrated the life and work of Bill Etra, who was the co-inventor of the Rut Etra synthesizer, which was used extensively by Peck Nam Jun. The project was a 12-hour durational performance that linked 17 different cities. All participants used Live Lab to connect, and even through, uh, and even though there were a wide uh, array of technical uh, capabilities, everyone was able to join. From Culture Hub, we live edited the incoming feeds into live streamed experiences for online viewers. Um, these are just uh, a few of the hundred experiments um, we've conducted over the past decade. So um, now it's a matter of developing a community of practice around this type of work. And we don't, uh, don't want to lie, it's, it's very difficult. There are numerous challenges, including time differences, language barriers, asymmetrical organizational capacities, and, and not enough knowledge or way of concretely measuring the value and possibilities, which is an issue that we have within the arts field in general. However, we feel confident after a decade of research and productions in this area that that it is the way of the future. It is our belief that artists have a unique ability to unpack and explore our relationship to technology. Positioned as storytellers, communicators, examiners of emotions, the intellect, and humanity in general, they can reflect back what they have discovered in singular, exciting, and accessible ways that could potentially have impact and influence, and sometimes even calling us to action and for greater impact, these artists need to be partnered uh, with other industries and creative technologists. We are working towards a dy dynamic convergence of art and technology. The art of today and the not so distant future is growing ever more interdisciplinary and should also be pushing towards radical diversity in the sense that we need new pathways that can promote better understanding between global citizens. Art can be a vehicle for change. And as Karen Finley said last night at La Mama, art is revolution. Through her foundation, I was introduced to the philosopher Jonathan Lear, who wrote about this concept of radical hope and the ethics in the face of cultural devastation. He looked at the plight of the Native American genocide and ethnocide. What makes this hope radical, Lear writes, is that it is directed toward a future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. Radical hope is something that we strive for and is not something that just comes into existence. In this new technological era, we need to work together to provide environments and networks, both physical and virtual, that artists can leverage when exploring our human relationships to technology and to each other, building towards that beautiful one world. Thank you so much.
So I would like to thank everyone for your speech. Uh, obviously, the theme for this session is technology, technology enabling art and culture, and possibly vice versa. So I would like to open it to the floor. Any question from the audience? Sale at Christie's, where a uh, where an AI um, developed painting was sold for over four hundred thousand um, dollars, and I think it was originally thought to go from like seven to ten, and it just blew it out of the water. And I just wanted to talk about. I think it's super interesting. I, where where do you guys think the future of art in that kind of context is going? Would like to start. I, I mean, I guess I can, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm wearing a microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess I uh, uh, don't want to specifically talk about the Christie sale just because I, I don't necessarily have like my thoughts around it. Um, uh, but I would say that we've, we've just recently hosted a talk by a really great uh, cultural critic named Nora Khan who has done a lot of writing and work on artists engaged with artificial intelligence practices broadly. And, and the way artists have engaged with AI platforms is really divergent. There are artists like Ian Chang, who had an amazing show at MoMA PS1 last year, um, that you know, is interested in building simulations that like, run off artificial intelligence, but look to a viewer like a video game that's playing itself. Um, there are artists like Sandra Perry, who are interested in creating uh, basically uh, chatbot type situations that try to reveal certain biases in artificial intelligence systems. And then there are artists like Harm van den Dorpel, who's a Berlin-based artist, who's producing, um, who's basically uh, training uh, machine learning networks to understand his visual style and create kind of new visual styles that are divergent from it. Um, all of those things are really interesting. The field is obviously rapidly developing, as we've seen from the, your applications of it in the space. Um, so it's, it's exciting to see what could happen in the future, but it's a little, um, it shouldn't be reduced to like one AI-generated painting being sold at auction. It's, it's a huge field of practices and one that's really exciting and just at its jumping off point. Is this something that you guys are looking into at IGE as well? As a uh, side product, maybe? <laughs> actually, currently, AI is majorly used by she, especially for the uh, efficiency and help the artist to, to create contents, but not to create, uh, create contents by machines at country. But I believe that's uh, in the future because you know the favor of uh, our users are really differ uh, uh, a lot, and uh, uh, some you, you can see that some uh, some contents already be generated by by AI already, uh, and uh, that's also consumable. Maybe not art, but uh, I think that's uh, still useful for the kind of word for for massive use base. Yeah, I believe so. The surprise lecture uh, speaker I was talking about, he's actually from Google. So uh, a very small research arm under Google called Google Arts and Culture in Paris. They are actually deliberately creating uh, AI-generated pieces. So they took some famous painting and uh, using machine learning uh, algorithms. They made uh, many, a lot of uh, intermediate works of the paintings. So they thought the artist might uh, came up with make, come up with all these intermediates. So they are deliberately making it, and the estimate of seven thousand to ten thousand that was based on the piece that was sold prior to this auction, and the first piece was actually made by Google. So uh, there are actually a lot of people working on it now. And I mean, my, as, a, as an artist myself, I think that's freaking scary. Because <laughs> what does that mean? You know, and I think all, so many industries are going through that. Like, what does this mean to all these industries that are based on humans, you know, and humans creating it? So, I mean, I, I think, you know, Billy, you could talk some, some about some of these artists who are looking at some of the, um, yeah. the robots. And, and so I feel like it, it's really necessary, again, going back to what we were saying, that artists are a part of that conversation of looking at the technology of 
the robotics and, and really in, having that influence themselves and then reflecting it back out. And I don't know what that's going to ultimately um, create and what is humanity in these AI created art pieces. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's the big question that we're sort of in that moment of transition. Um, well, I think it, it, the scary thing to me is that, that cor it, it can be, if, if it can be monetized, right, then, then, then corporations are, are going to move forward with producing the, these types of um, artificial intelligence that, that will be able to, to generate money uh, within the art and culture sphere. So, but the interesting thing to me is, is when the, there's a dialogue between, between artists and between artificial intelligence that's looking critically at this scenario, right? So we have a current resident artist, uh, Blair uh, Simmons, that is uh, developing machine learning uh, software that can read plays and generate uh, text uh, back in the syntax of the playwright. So it reads Brecht, it generates stuff that, that you, know, you know, sounds like Brecht or Shakespeare or whatever that it reads. Um, but it can't tell a story yet. Right, so it doesn't understand how to create that arc in a way uh, that that humans can appreciate it as a story. So she's trying to drive it closer, push it closer, um, and I think that she's going to fail um, because she's one, you know, um, downtown artist that's working in this in this sphere. But in that failure, there might be some really interesting revelations, and 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 then restaging that with with humans and interpreting it. And, and Mia and Billy, I don't mean to scare you further, but I know there are <laughs> scientists who are actually working on, they're researching the possibility of consciousness mm. for machines. Mm. So once they prove that, even, even if it's, it might be a different form of consciousness than humans, then that's going to be very scary. <laughs> we had a question uh, in the fourth, fourth, fifth row from the lady. All right, thank you. I just want to thank all the panelists for your great presentation. Um, my question is, from your perspective and works experience, what is the biggest challenge of using technology to engage with young generations through your business or within your industry? Thank you. For young people, young people are well versed with the technology. They are the main promoter of LGC. So for the young people, if they if they can really enhance their content production, if they can really deliver valuable content, to really enhance the cultural value of their content, what, how can we promote that? I don't think we can do that through traditional education. The only way to do that is to build a digital service system so that young people, so that young people can engage, can have access to the huge library of existing art collection. That's why we have to open up all the libraries of uh, art institutions so that they are valuable. They are available to the younger generation. Otherwise, they will be just locked in a very, uh, in a locked in a very exclusive library. That would not serve any purpose. We need to open up all our artistic resources to our younger generations so that they can, Im they can immerse themselves with existing art collection. Zach, you would like to add on that? Oh, um, yeah, I, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of opening museum collections, that's very important um, and something that, uh, that, we've, that we've worked on just through uh, supporting open, <laughs> Yeah, basically like open access, free collections of digital things, and then also supporting efforts like um, Wikibase, uh, which is Wikimedia Foundation's repository software that allows very different types of collections to be linked to one another through like basic information. So someone might be working um, on a computer-based work in 1973 or something, and someone else might be 
creating a painting at that same time that has nothing to do with the opposite side of the world, but that you know date of creation could link these two things and reflect a broader cultural moment anyway. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, collections that better speak to their viewers will be an important part of collecting or connecting with digitally savvy viewers. Um, arts and culture has done a lot of work to that end as well. Well, thank you very much for this panel discussion. It's very interesting. I mean, um, technology and culture, uh, they can be encouraged by new uh, technology development. But there are things like we talk about the AI stuff um, that could be a challenge to all of us. But uh, when you think about the future, it's the new reality. It's de definitely different from the reality that we are in today. So there's going to be a new form of human culture as well. Like you mentioned, your daughter's reality is totally different. So. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.